Take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to hit something that, that we all know. Uh, we all know this, but it is something that uh, our youth needs to be reminded of from, uh, from time to time. Uh, and just in case the world start to get into or, 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 or sway some of your opinions, as well, we need to be reminded of this. Uh, we're going to be dealing with socialism. You say, why are you dealing with socialism? Because it is rampant today. Not socialism itself, but the desire to be socialist. Uh, our nation, uh, whether you think it was rigged or not, half of the vote... Uh, not this past election, but two elections back, half the vote, I believe it was Hillary Clinton won the popular vote even though Trump had won. And that was a vote for socialistic ideas. Biden getting in is again socialistic ideas. People today, uh, even Christians are leaving biblical morals and looking into this and liking this. And I've seen some stuff today and it just infuriated me. I've been studying it this week again and I was looking at some things. And uh, a professor in schools was really just trashing capitalism. Our economic economic system here in the United States is being trashed by our professors to our children. Our children are being taught it is the evil of our society and that it needs to be re reformed, it needs to be replaced with socialistic ideas. And that's why a lot of our kids today are voting for it. They make it sound so good if you don't know your Bible, you don't know what the Lord says on the subject, you would be convinced that, yeah, there's some truth there. We need to do that. Yeah, that's right. That sounds fair. But it's not. It's not biblical. It's not right. And, and it will not work in America. It will not work. Now, if you want to go to China, if you want socialism and know what it's about, go to China. Go to North Korea. Go to Russia. Go over there and find out what communism, socialism, progressivism, liberalism, that's the same thing. They just keep changing the name. When they couldn't sell it to you under one name, they renamed it, rebranded it, and tried to sell it again. That's all that's going on. Honestly, that's exactly what it is. Now, we're going to look at what God says and, and, and not apologize for it, it's not going to be politically correct, but, that, but, but God doesn't try to be politically correct. Amen? He created us and He just says, this is it. Do it this way. And He blesses us if we do it His way. And when we don't do it His way, we suffer for it. And I'll show you some things, hopefully tonight, uh, remind you of some things, or maybe even teach you something if you'll listen. Genesis 2 and verse 15. Right off the bat, we know Genesis chapter 1, God created everything. Genesis 2, he's talking about how he created man. And now look at this in Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, right off the bat, when Adam is mentioned, he put him to work. Where did he put him? He put him in the garden. He said, you just go right there and then you can go down to the government building you can sign up and get cheese and you can get housing you can get everything paid. You can get all this assistance if you just go around the oak tree there by the vineyard over yonder and they, they just fill out the paperwork you can have it all. No. He put him in the vineyard for what purpose? He put him in the garden for what purpose? To dress it and keep it. And here's something else for our young men. Before, that, before God brought him a woman, he already had a place to stay and a job. <laughs> Amen. 
Something wrong with these boys today. They want to get married and don't even have a job. Don't have a place to stay. Don't have any work. And they want to get married. Where are you going to live? You're going to live off one of, the, one of the parents? That's where the parents need to crack the whip. Amen? Tell that bum you ain't taking my daughter. <laughs> Amen? And they'll just run off. Let them run off. Amen? It sounds hard, but I tell you what, it's... Uh, when when we stand up for what's right, our kids will see how serious we are about it. The problem is we cater we cater all the time. We back down, we back up, we won't punish, we won't do what we say, and and we're just teaching them to push the limits. But anyway, socialism is not God's way. Never was, not from the very beginning. From the very beginning, as soon as He created man. He put him in the garden to dress it, to keep it. That was how he got to eat. Amen. Now, God's economic plan for us is basically what we call today free market capitalism. Now, again, in the schools today, in the media, and a lot of our politicians go around and they bash it, they make it sound horrible, they say, yeah, it's for, the, it's for the men with the money, it's for those that's got the money, it's for the businessman, but it's not for the little man, and they make it sound so, so horrible and terrible and make it sound like everybody with money or everybody successful uh, did it on the backs of someone else and they ought to be ashamed and they ought to have to pay more taxes than the rest of us. And, and, and people say, well, well, preacher, don't you? Don't you think that somebody that makes a, a million dollars a year or $400,000 a year ought to pay a little bit more taxes than, than someone else? No, I don't. I don't think that at all. Well, why not? Two reasons. First, it's not fair. And secondly, that ain't God's way. That ain't God's way. If you're going to do it, do it right. Amen? Now, we've got capitalism has its problems. But it is the greatest system and made our country great. Our country is great and we have the freedoms and liberties we enjoy today because of that system. If we allow this next generation coming up or this generation that is here now to keep pushing this socialistic agenda, we're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Not just us, but our children. Because all these promises of free, free school, free health care, free housing, free phone, free cheese, free everything. There's nothing free except for salvation and it costs the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody has to pay. Yeah. So all this free stuff that the politicians are promising, someone's paying for it. You know who's paying for it? We are. The working class. The ones that are working and paying taxes, that what they're doing is they're taking from some who's working and giving to some who won't work. That's socialism. Yep. That's it in a nutshell. That's it super simplified. That's it where anybody can understand it. Now, let's define it. Let's define it by, by the dictionary. By the dictionary, it says this, no Webster's Dictionary, any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership. That means the community owns it. How, how many of you have ever heard of these politicians? I've heard it in the last couple of elections, the last couple of times, especially, uh, I ain't going to say no names, I'm going to be nice tonight. Uh, but I, I've heard several of the politicians say, well, how did that man get successful? He didn't do it. He did it on the back of others. So it's really not his business. It's our business, like everybody who works there's business. No, it's not. He's the one with the dream. He's the one with the vision. He's the one that took the risk. He's the one that spent the sweat and the equity. He's the one that stuck his neck out and worked and sweat and hired people to help him and paid them for their services and they agreed to that payment or they wouldn't have went to work for it. Then when he does build a business and he is successful, all of a sudden 
Everybody wants to lay, state claim to it? No. They didn't risk anything. They were hired. They were paid a wage. He actually not only was successful for himself, but think how many times he made others successful, brought them out of poverty, gave them when they had no job, provided for them when they had nothing so they could provide for their families. They did a good thing. See, today, socialism a lot of times vilifies success and successful businessmen and women and people who actually make money. They make it sound like if you're wealthy, you're evil. If you've got money, there's, there's something wrong. That shouldn't be. You did it unfairly. You need to be taxed more than others. You need to pay your fair share. If you pay... Ta I, I, well, I'll get into that a little bit, but let's keep going here. Any various economic and political theory advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. That's the definition. That's the definition of socialism according to Webster's. See, they won't define what, what socialism is. They'll give you all these different ideas of what, what they say it is, but that's what the, the proper definition of socialist, socialism is. And I'll put it to you simply. They believe in big government. The government ought to own everything. The government ought to, ought to put regulations on everything. How much you can make, how, how, long you can, how long you can produce it, who you can hire, who you can't hire, and where does it go, the profits. That's government ownership. That's government administration. They control everything about it. They set all the rules and regulations and government distribution. They decide who gets part, who gets it. That's not right. That's not right at all. And it will destroy this country. It will destroy any country. Why? Because it's not God's way. Now, uh, let's keep going here. The Bible teaches individual responsibility. We have an individual responsibility to provide for our own food, provide for our own family, and give to others in need. That's the Bible set up for it. Take care of the or orphans. Take care of the widows and the widows indeed. Take care of those that are downtrodden, those that go through trouble. That's God's plan for it. But socialism demands. Socialism divides. Not only does it demand, it demands through higher taxes and other means of collecting money. Have you ever stopped and thought about this, how much taxes you actually pay? Before you get your check, years ago when I was working at the Ford Place, I, 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 the Lord blessed my hand. He really did. The Lord blessed my hand. I made pretty good money during that time. And the Lord blessed my hand. He would take more out than, than, than he'd take more out than, than some people make in a week out of my check. It was going back to Uncle Sam. Then, when I bought something, I had to pay tax for it. Then, every year, if I kept it, I had to pay tax on it again. If I sold it and made profit off of it, any at all, I was supposed to pay tax on it again. How many times can you tax the same thing? Have you ever thought about that? You buy land, you think you own it. But do you really, or are you just written it from Uncle Sam? Because anytime he wants to, he can up the taxes on it, just like he did this year. Anytime he wants to, he can change the value. How many of you have ever heard of eminent domain? If Uncle Sam decides it's for the populace's best interest to put a road right through your house, he'll give you what he says is fair value for your house, evict you and plow right through your house, legally, in America. And it only gets worse if we go socialist, because then it's the collectives, everybody's. It's mob rule, basically. It's mob rule. 
and the mob's got a few voices that'll be at the top. And they'll be the ones skimming all the money off the top. Amen. That's what's going on. But let's keep going here. I'll give you some things to help you. Not only does it demand, it demands that you who work give to those who won't, won't work. Then it divides. It also divides. They, uh, the government takes your earnings and gives it to who they deem fit. And that causes division. You say, well, how does that cause divisions? You take money from me and you give to somebody and that sucker's too sorry to work. He won't take care of his own kids. He won't take care of his own family. He won't take care of anything. She won't work. She won't do anything. She won't. But, but yet, every time you go by the HUD housing where it's government assisted, where they pay for their phones, they give them all this stuff nine times out of ten, they had a Cadillac in the yard. Every time you see them, they got their nails done. Their hair's permed. That stuff ain't cheap. Where'd they get that money? They ain't working. They're standing in welfare lines. They're talking about needing assistance. I actually heard one woman, they was interviewing some woman on, on, on some news documentary thing, and they was interviewing her. She says, well, when I get my paycheck, paycheck, she was talking about getting her monthly support from the government. She called it her paycheck. Like she earned it. Like she deserves it. That's not Bible. Right. Now I'm going to show you some things. That it's, I told you it's not going to be politically correct, but it's going to be biblically correct. I'm going to show you some verses in a little bit. But it causes division. It causes division. It creates the haves and the have-nots. And the have-nots are mad thinking the haves, those who work, those who sweated, those who risked and, and took what get sacrificed to get the education, spent the years, spent the time, learned the trade, performed it, I mean, did what they were supposed to do and get to reap the benefits of doing right, they're evil and wicked. That's what it does. And the ones that have, when they see how much is being taken from them to give to them that won't work, they're aggravated too. It ought to infuriate us. Amen. We need to be teaching our kids the importance of work and teaching them a work ethic because that's the way God said to do it. Amen. From the beginning, when He put Adam in the garden, He gave him a job. Amen. Let's keep going here. Well, in fact, I'll just start giving you some verses. In Genesis 2.15, God created man, put him to work. There was no welfare. There was no food stamp. There was no government cheese. Adam worked to provide for his food. He kept the garden that he might eat of the garden and provide not just for himself, but for his future wife that was coming. Amen. The law of first mention. How many of you have ever heard that term? The law of first mention. There's a biblical thing. Every time you find something in the Bible, usually the first time you see it in the Bible, that sets the standard or the tone throughout the Bible. So the first time we have man being mentioned, he's given a job and told to go to work. That's before the law. That's while he's in the garden. Yes, God, God gave him a... Uh, a hand up and gave him the land and said there it is but you got to keep it and dress it he had a job let's go to the next next uh, men turn to Genesis 4 and Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said I've gotten a man from the Lord and she again bare his brother Abel and Abe, now watch verse 2 and Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Before we're told anything else about them, we're told they're born, and then we're told what they did as a career or a living, what their job was. Can you see it? Yeah. He was a, now let me read it again. And she bare his brother Abel, and he was a collector of checks, but Cain was a filler out of programs, you know. 
fill her out of applications of, for different programs. It, yeah, now they had jobs. You understand what I'm saying? They worked. They had jobs. Uh, they, they had responsibility. They could do with that as they pleased. The government did come in there and say, okay, Abel, you're feeding your sheep a little too close to the creek. You can only have so many sheep, so many head of sheep on so many acres. You got to be sure to fence them in. If you've got over so many sheep, you can't let them have access to the creek. You got to have them vaccinated or you can't eat them. Maybe just you and your family, but you can't sell them for public consumption. See that the government comes in there and over-regulates it and when someone is successful, put so much regulations on them that they can't succeed. And all that's doing is that's giving other people jobs to run around and just tell the one that's working, you can't do that. Why can't you do that? I don't get paid myself if I tell you you can do that. That's government. That's what it is. They've got more paperwork and more useless jobs checking on people, trying to keep people in line. Amen? Right. That's, that sounds horrible, but that's the truth. Uh, let's keep going. I'll give you something. This is before the law. I'm going to give you something during the law and after the law in the New Testament as well. Because I know there'll be somebody saying, well, that was before human government was established. Yeah, human government has been established now, and we are under it. We are to obey the laws of the land. We are to follow our elected leaders. We are to do that. But that doesn't change the fact that God blesses His way. And when the government goes the wrong way, it's because we put the wrong ones in there. And we've allowed them to deviate and veer from the biblical way. Amen? That's our fault for putting the wrong ones in. We suffer for it. Okay? So let's keep going. Uh, Genesis 13. Here's a wealthy man. Here's one of the first wealthy men spoken of in the Bible. Now, when I say this, I'm going to preface this right off the bat. Y'all know me. I don't have anything. Somebody listening on the internet, somebody listening to this CD sometime might think, well, that preacher's just preaching that because he must have money. I ain't got no money. I don't have anything. Most of my suits come from Goodwill. I don't have too much pride to admit that and tell you that. Amen. I don't have anything. I trust the Lord to take care of me. The Lord takes care of me. Amen. If He don't give me what He want, what I've been wanting, He'll give. He'll change my wonder. Amen. <laughs> I've learned to be content. Amen. So this is a good thing. But anyway, so I, I, I'm not. I'm not defending myself or anyone I know. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And here is a rich man, and I'm gonna show it to you. And Abraham went out of Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abraham was what? Very rich in cattle, in silver, in gold. Amen. He was a wealthy man. Not only that, but you can keep reading. Uh, a little later, him and him and Lot's servants. He's got servants. He's so wealthy. He's got. He's got. He's hired people to do stuff for him. Now he don't even have to do anything. He hires people, and people does his stuff for him. But but him and Lot split up. If you remember, and then Lot Lot got tangled up in some little war going on and got carried away. So Abraham took three hundred of his servants. He's got 300 people working for him. He goes down there and gets a lot. You remember that story? Yeah. <coughs> Wealthy man. What does God say about that? Well, if you remember, turn to Genesis 14. Look at this. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he, ar he armed his trained servants. He had trained servants. Born in his own house, 318, and pursued them into Dan. Now, that's where he had those servants. But Abraham had been faithful in his stewardship. And God blessed him because of his character, because of his stewardship. Well, preacher, I'm a Christian. How come I don't have anything? Maybe God can't trust you. Maybe your stewardship with money is not what it ought to be. Amen? He blessed Abraham with a lot of money and wealth and he trusted him. How many of you remember the parable of the pounds? The parable of the pounds. What did he do? 
that one, he was given 10 pounds, he took it, he invested it, and he gained more for his master. To another he gave five, and he took it, invested it, and gained and gave it to his master. And to one, he gave one, and he took it and hid it, and he didn't do anything. So he took from the one, now this is backwards, he didn't take from the one that had ten, he took from the guy that had one. Because he was a poor steward, he wouldn't do anything with it, and he took it from him and gave it to the one that had ten. See, God's, God's plan is not take from the wealthy and give to the poor. It's to take from those who won't do anything and give to those who will. He gives to those, uh, uh, let me see a better way to word this, He gives to those that are better stewards of what they're given, and He will hold them accountable. He don't take from each according to what they have or have not. He gives to those according to their ability. Man, that's good when you get a hold of it. Let's show you another rich guy, Job. Job. Most of you know the story. Now we hit Job chapter 1. Well, you know the story for time's sake, so I can keep going. Job was a rich man. You know he was a wealthy man. Uh, but before we're told that he's wealthy, you know what we're told there? Look at it in Job chapter 1 there. We're told that he's upright. He eschewed evil. He was perfect. He feared God. We're told those things before we're told about all of his riches and his wealth. He lost it all. Why? Because one day, the, one day when the Lord said, as I've considered my servant Job, he said, yeah, you've blessed him. He's got all this. That's why he said, he said no, no, that's not it at all. He's a man of character. He, 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 he's he, he, he's, he's going he's gonna to stick by stuff. You can take all that if you want to. And the devil did. Took all these camels, his asses, ruined his business, killed, ran off all these servants, turned his wife on him, took his kids, burned their houses down, their properties, took it all from him, even his health. But Job didn't curse God. So you know what God did in the end? Blessed him with double what he had in the beginning. See, he gives to those who will be good stewards. It's stewardship and individual accountability. That's what, that's what matters, amen? So rich people aren't evil like they're trying to teach our kids today. They're not. There's some tight wads out there, but you know what? Some of the greediest, stingiest, nasty people I know are people without anything. And that's the truth. You know who some of the most giving people I know is? People with money. God blesses them because they give. And when they realize that and they continue to give and God continues to bless, they get excited and try to help others with it. And greedy people just want more, 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 more. And God's saying, oh, no, 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 not good stewards. You're just wrong reasons. And they don't bless it. And it don't accumulate. That's socialism. Amen? That's the way the world wants to do it. Let's keep going here. I've heard people say this. They don't need that much money. Nobody can spend that much money. They couldn't spend that money in two lifetimes. That's more than they could ever spend. You don't know. You don't know that at all. You don't know how many employees they have. You don't know the benefits that they're given. You don't know how much he pays in 401ks and insurances and how much he provides for his help. You don't know how many checks he signs. You don't know. It's easy to say, well, they could never do that. I, you know, no, that's more than they could, ever, they could ever give. Listen. A lot of times it's the wealthy that provides jobs and incomes and benefits and useful products for many people that lift <laughs> many out of poverty, that help many take care of their families. It's the wealthy that's doing that. That's good stewards with what they have. How many of you know who Bill Gates is? I don't know if Bill Gates is a Christian. I don't. I hope he is. But I have no clue if he is. But here's the thing. 
I, I heard somebody say this one time, Bill Gates could go to the bathroom and from the time he got into the bathroom and come out, he made more money than I made in a year. Just while he's in the bathroom. He can make more money sitting in the bathroom reading a magazine. He's, he's done made more money than I can working hard all year. Amen? That's Bill Gates. And they say, no way he deserves all that. He ought to pay more. And if I ain't mistaken, Bill Gates might be a little on the socialist side. I ain't sure. I think his thinking's a little off. Uh, he's saying, yeah, we need to pay him more. It's easy to say when you got as much as he's got. Amen? <laughs> it's easy to say when you got. But, but anyway... People will talk and say, well, he ought to give more. He ought to do this. Listen, he deserves every penny he made. That's coming from somebody with nothing. I'm not covetous of what he's got. I'm glad that, that he was able to do that. I'm glad to be in a country where someone can do that. He was a boy in a garage with an idea and worked hard and earned that money. It's not the government's place to take it from him and give it to the guy down the street rather than being in a, in a garage working nights and days and weekends, giving it to the one who was out there laying out of school, fishing and playing and doing nothing and goofing off. You understand what I'm saying? One earned it, one didn't. Amen. Amen. That's, ooh, that's good. But anyway... Uh, again, that's again, Job, that's a good picture there, illustration. Job got twice as much in the end. Why? Because he's stewardship. It's the character that matters. Uh, here's something else. Here's something else. Write this down. Exodus 20. We know in Exodus 20 you have the Ten Commandments. Uh, 2015 says that thou shalt not steal. 2017 says thou shalt not covet. Did you know socialism breaks both those commandments? You've got the poor that don't have anything coveting what someone else has. And then you've got the government stealing from those that do have to give to those that don't have. That's what it is. What would you call it? If, if, the, government, if the government come in and said, listen, I looked on your W-2 form, they gave you a slight raise at work, and, and this, is ha this happened to me at the Ford place. Uh, I, I got a raise one time at work and, and brought home less. How, how'd that happen? It put me in a different tax bracket, so they hit me harder for taxes and took more out in taxes than I got in raise. Say, so what'd you do? I went in the office and told them, take, take your raise back. I don't want it. I was better off without the raise, amen? And you say, what did they do? They did. They did. Why? I was serious about it, amen? I didn't want to give Uncle Sam nothing, amen? Because I knew he didn't, know, he, he didn't have the character and, and didn't have the track record to do right by it, amen? So I said, take it back. I don't give him no more than I have to. Amen. Get quiet in here. It's true. Socialism breaks the commandments. No Christian should support theft from one to give to another. No Christian should cover, covet what others have. That's just the truth of it. Uh, the problem is, today our politicians go around stirring everybody up. Vote for me and you have free schooling. I think we ought to have free schooling. Vote for me and we ought to have free health care. I think nobody should have to pay for health care in America. We ought to be like Canada. That's why Canada, Canadians come down here to get health care. I, I, I think our prices ought to be like those. <laughs> Amen. Especially in the pharmaceutical part. But, but, but that's a whole new bug. That's another sermon. <laughs> Amen. But again, there's some problems with that socialistic ideology, it's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. And when you hear these politicians promising free schools and free this and amnesty for this crowd and amnesty for that crowd and we're going to forgive this and we're going to give money to this group and that group, they're lying through their teeth just to get your vote. Because as soon as they get in the office, that... that, that if it even gets brought up, they'll vote for it knowing, or they'll try to push it through, knowing that nobody else in Congress is going to let it happen so they can come back and complain. See, I told you them mean 
people on the other side. Them mean Democrats wouldn't let me do it. Them mean Republicans wouldn't let me do it. That old Ron Paul, that independent, he wouldn't let me do it. They fought against it. You see, they could blame someone else knowing full well that they couldn't do half what they said. And if they did, it would destroy our country because nothing's free. Somebody's going to have to pay. And if it ain't you, it's going to be your children or grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And that's what I fear today. I fear today that our society is so selfish today, they think only about themselves. Our forefathers thought about us. They thought about us and what we would have to face and what way we would live and what we would have. They sacrificed then so that we could have better. Now we want to live better and let our kids pay. There's something wrong with that picture. There's something wrong with that picture. Who's the real sinner when it comes down to it? Who's the real sinner? The one who takes from one to give to another, the one who earns a lot and says that it's mine and I should be able to keep it and spend it how I see fit, take care of my family and my friends and take care of the people in my community if the Lord allows it. You know what J.C. Penney did? J.C. Penney. Now, I know most of the stores is closing. You know why? Because the kids took over the business and the kids didn't follow like what they was set up and it's costing them their business. Amen. But J.C. Penney set it up. He worked hard. He started, he got all that, he got all that merchandise, worked out all those deals, was selling it, was making money and everything. And as he began to grow wealthy, he increased his giving. He increased his tithes to church. He increased his missions. He increased his giving. And by the time they said that he passed away, he was given nearly 95% away and still had more money than most of us could even imagine. His kids get it, and within a generation of that kind of cash flow, that kind of money, that kind of worth, within a generation or two, they're closing doors all over the country. Why? They quit giving. They weren't good stewards. It's all, all God's way and God's blessings. Amen. Amen. There's a thing in the Bible that teaches you reap what you sow in Galatians 6, 7. Here it is. You want to see some New Testament? This is the clincher here. Turn to, turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. You all know the verse well, I'm sure. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. But our kids need to hear this from time to time, and it wouldn't do it wouldn't do it wouldn't do you any harm to memorize it and quote it to your professor or to your teacher. Amen. Well, what is about this? They'll say, "Oh, it's old and archaic." But hey, listen, it worked. It worked. They tried socialism in America. They just didn't tell you about it in school. I'm going to. Let me show you this verse though. Second Thessalonians three ten. 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3, verse 10. Here, I'm in 1 Thessalonians. I thought that did look right. <laughs> 3 and verse 10. It says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. What if Adam hadn't dressed the garden and kept it? Do you think he'd have been getting fruit off of the fruit trees and off the vines? He was, to, he was to keep it and dress it. He was to take care of the garden, amen, if he wanted to eat from it, amen. Uh, so that's before the law. During the law says the same thing. You can get that in Psalms 128 and verse 2. It says, eat the labor of thine own hands. You'll find it again in Psalms. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it's over and over throughout the Word of God, amen. But keep going down here in 2 Thessalonians 3. Look at the next verse. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. What is he calling disorderly? Working not at all, but are busybodies. They won't work. They're busybodies. They're just keeping up with the latest gossip. They won't work. They're not making any money. But yet they all have cell phones and they're all smartphones and they're all on Facebook. 
They're taking vacations and pictures of themselves, posting it on Facebook so everybody can see where they go and what they're having for dinner and all this stuff. Amen. Amen. <coughs> now you tell me that's right. Somebody that won't work lays around fornicating, won't go to church, won't live right, won't do right, making babies out of wedlock, costing the government all kinds of money because they won't take care of their own children, continuing to live that lifestyle, won't get it right and expect you to pay and think you're evil and wicked if you don't. Or you're a racist. Or you're, or you're wrong in the way you think. That is exactly what's going on today. And they think that they're right. The professors makes it sound so good, but it ain't biblical. It ain't right. It ain't spiritual. It's wicked. And it will destroy this nation. The fact that men never learn from history proves it. Because watch. It has been tried in America. I jotted this down. William Bradford. Write down William Bradford, first governor here in the, here in the, the colonies when, they, when we came over here. When they came over, he, they established rules and laws that every family, when they come over here, they was going to work together and they was going to they was going to put everything together, pull their resources, pull their energy, pull their everything together, and everybody was going to benefit from it. Now, what does that sound like? Socialism. Now, watch. They established rules and laws that every family was to give their harvest to a communal storehouse that would divide the goods equally among all the citizens. It nearly destroyed them. It was disastrous. He wrote in his 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 he wrote in his letters and in his books and stuff that was found that from him from that time what he wrote and he said it almost destroyed. It divided them because the ones who went out and worked in the fields and sweated and day after day and worked hard didn't get no more than the one who wouldn't come out of the house because it was too hot. The women refused to work. The young children refused to go out into the field. The, the women wouldn't allow them to go out in the fields and help work. And they put it all on the men and then some of the men refused to work and it discouraged those who would work from succeeding. Because why should I work and sweat my blood, sweat, and tears in this field to feed that sorry bum that won't even come out? Amen. Was the attitude. When they did away with that and said every man eats of his own labor, he wrote in his diaries, even the children came out. Greatest harvest we ever had. <laughs> Amen. Why? When people realized there was going to be no more free handouts, they went to work. And they started earning something. And they quit crying and complaining about the heat or the headache or this or that. And they taught their kids the value of work if you want to eat. Amen? And that's what built this great nation. Was every man getting to keep what he worked for? He'll stand responsible for what he does with it, or she'll stand responsible for what she does with it. Amen? Not the government. Individuals. But who learns from history? Amen? Here, let me give you this. I, I talked about the parable of the talents. You're familiar with it, but are you, do you remember the parable of the laborers? See, it's in there more than you think. People just don't think. But the parable of the laborers is basically the same. And, and, and it's in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Here's the basic story. A farmer had a bunch of land, had a bunch of stuff. He was he, His harvest had come in. Maybe he had somebody said, listen, I'll buy it all. 
but you gotta have it in today. Because for some reason, this guy wanted it all in this day. He needed to get it all in. There was a deadline when he had to get his product ready and delivered. So he goes and he gets everybody out in the field early that morning. They're working and they all agree to work for a penny a day. <coughs> now that's fair. That's good money back then. Amen. That, they, so they agreed to work for that and help him get his harvest in. Well, come about midday, he realized we ain't making a dent in this. We're not getting close. So he runs into town and he sees a bunch of men standing around. Why was they standing? Because they didn't have Xbox, Playstations, Nintendos, and TVs. So they was in town hanging out. He said, what are y'all doing hanging out in town? Get in the field and work. I'll take care of you. I'll pay you. I'll be fair to you. They said, okay. And they went out in the field. Well, a couple of hours go by and he realizes he still ain't going to make his deadline. So he goes back again and sees a few more standing around. And he says, why ain't y'all in the field? Go out in the field and I, well, what does it pay? Don't worry about that. I'll take care of you. And they go out in the field and they begin to work. Well, gets the harvest in. I'm sure he's excited. At the end of the day, he's excited. He's going to, he's met the quota. He's going to be able to deliver his product. So he goes to the, he starts paying them and he pays the last ones that come in first. The one that only worked an hour, he went over there and said, here, here's your penny. Thank you for your work. And he goes down here, the ones only work maybe four hours of the day, and he pulls it up and he gives each one of them a penny and says, thank you, I appreciate your work, appreciate you coming in. And then he goes to the ones that was there that morning, worked through the heat of the day, worked all day long, sweated, watched him just do that. And he goes over here and gives them a penny and says, thank you so much for your help. This guy's mad. Why? Because he's looking at what everybody else has got. What did he agree to? He agreed for a penny a day. What difference does it make what he gave them? But see, he began to covet. He began to lust that one thing. I worked at a Ford dealership, and while I was there, I wasn't paid by the hour. I was paid by the job. And I began to work, and, I, and the Lord blessed me. He did. He blessed me. None of them wanted to go to school. I wanted to go to every school they'd send me to. I would have lived down in Charlotte in those schools to learn that stuff. Driving back and forth. I did my time. I sacrificed making money to, to take school pay. They, they, they paid me to go to school, but it wasn't near as good as if you was still at work. So I would take that cut and pay to go learn the new, the new stuff coming on the cars, to learn the new stuff, and to learn everything that was coming out, and how that system worked, and how it should work, and how to work on it. I would go every chance I got. They never wanted to go. So when the cars began coming in, I knew what to do, and they didn't. And my salary went boom. And all of a sudden, they began to complain. So I started taking anything that would come in. When they, I come in, they carburetors was going out and fuel injection was coming in and they, they, they didn't want nothing to do with electronics. So I was taking electronics and when I started making more money then, all of a sudden they wanted electronics. A new engine come out, nobody wanted to work on the front wheel drive stuff. You, I, you probably remember that. Nobody wanted to work on front wheel drive stuff. So I got them all. I paid for my house with a 3.8 engine. I could tear that thing down to sleep. I mean, I can, I'm serious. I believe I could be asleep and, and in my sleep tie the heads off that thing. So that time it overheated a little bit. Tarsk was the worst car they ever made. <laughs> if you had one of them, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> hey, man, if you overheated it slightly, man, it was a head job. I loved that car. <laughs> Never would buy one, though, but I loved that car. <laughs> but, but those guys would get so jealous and so mad See, they didn't want nothing to do with them, and they were awful. They were horrible. The first one I did, I didn't like it. It was rough. I mean, they were tighter, harder to get to. It was new. You had to learn it all. First time, you didn't make no money. Second time, if you come close to time, you were happy. Third time, okay, made a little bit. Fourth time, okay, I know where this goes. I know everything. And before you know it, I'm doing two a day, and it's supposed to take me two days to do some of that stuff. You get so used to it because it's repetitious 
And then all of a sudden, they see me making money on it, and then all of a sudden, they wanted them all. Why? Never satisfied. Never satisfied. Always looking for somebody else. If you agree with something, and, and I, I want to point out something. This ain't me talking. This is the Lord talking. The Lord is giving that parable on the laborers. And the Lord pointed out that that man said that it was just. Why? It was his field. It was his money. You decided that you would do that. We agreed with this and you decided you would do it for that. You were happy with it until you seen I did this with them. I was just happy to get them to come in. I would have paid them more if they'd asked. Because he had a problem and they helped him fix it. Now, if he wasn't happy, if he wasn't happy, listen, if he wasn't happy, all he had to do was go down to the next vineyard. And if he was a good worker, they'd have paid him more. That's free market capitalism. If you felt your employee did you wrong, you go somewhere else, if you're a good employee, they'll pay you more. It'll work itself out. It'll work itself out. If you just do right, it'll work itself out. But socialism never does. It always punishes success and rewards laziness and slothfulness. Every time. And it, and it, it robs a country of those who want to succeed or those who want to thrive. And many times... When those policies start coming into effect, you know what happens? I've lived long enough to see this. And you have too, if you just be honest. When someone comes in to power and they get control and they start pushing socialistic ideas and big government, bigger regulations, bigger taxes, all the people with money take their businesses and move overseas. So the ones that would have helped the people have money, have jobs, are now going overseas because they're going over there where they can get their product at the same price or better. Or they don't have to pay somebody 20 bucks an hour to flip a hamburger. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? That's what's going on. And socialism is going to destroy our country. Now, let me keep going. Uh... I'm out of time, but uh, let me give you this. Who should give? Everyone should give. Even if you don't have anything, you ought to give. You ought to give of your time. You ought to give of your energy. We all can give something, amen? If you're not willing to give of your little, what makes you think you're going to give of a lot? Amen? It's like this. I was teaching on tithe one time, and I, I made this statement. If you won't tithe off of a $10, what makes you think you're going to tithe off of 10000 if you won't give a tithe off of a hundred, which is ten, what makes you think you're going to give a thousand if you get ten thousand? You're going to look at that thousand and say, Woohoo, I ain't got to give a lot. It's the same thing. Ten percent. Money is, a, is the, the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. Let me show you this verse. I want you to see this verse. There's a verse that talks about set not your heart to it. I'm trying to see where I put it. Psalm 62. I want you to see this. Here's the problem. Psalm 62, look at verse 10. Psalm 62, verse 10. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. Here it is. If riches increase, if riches increase, set not your heart upon them. The problem is when people start getting riches they, they quit looking to God. I've got money. I don't need God now. I, I can buy my way out of it. Not knowing the stock market could turn and you could lose it all. One accident and the right trip to the hospital you could lose it all. Somebody get hurt on your property or something like that. Crazy stuff. We're living in a crazy society right now. 
I can, I know right now this is no lie, no joke, and, and y'all, I, I know you know what I'm talking about. People have sued churches that don't even go to the church. They parked on the church ground one time, walked across instead of going across through the the the, the paved way to go to a, a celebration in the community. They used the church's parking lot and walked across the grass to go across the road, slipped and fell, and I think broke their ankle or twisted their ankle or something like that, ended up suing the church for thousands and got it. That's the society we live in today. Greed for money, amen? When you start trusting in money, that's when you're in trouble. It ain't, it ain't your money that can get you through, it's God. It's the Lord. Put your faith and trust in the Lord, amen? Even without money, he can do it. Amen. Amen. He didn't have, I mean, really. Mm. Now, any questions on this? Think about the private property. Oh, there's so much more I can give you. Oh, there's so much more I can give you. But I'm going to stop here because of time's sake. Oh, yeah. But anyway, any questions or concerns? Socialism is not God's way. It is not biblical. It is not even sound. It will ruin every nation. It will build government. It creates greed and divisions. You'll have the haves and the have-nots, and there'll be constant war and fussing and covetousness in that country until it tears itself apart. Socialism is the first step to full-blown communism. It's where it'll lead to. And you would think in America, wars we have fought against that, you would think that this wouldn't even be something that had to be taught in America. But it has to be screened in America. Repeatedly. All right. I appreciate your attention. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed. No questions or comments. Some of y'all are older than me, and I know you've lived to see more than this and know what I'm saying is true. Amen. <coughs> it's scary what's going to be for our kids, ain't it? How many times have they raised the deficit? How many, how many times have they raised it? Does anybody know? I meant to look, and I just did, and I, I, I quit looking years ago. What is our national debt? How many trillions now is it? 33. 33. Last time I looked was a couple years ago, and it was in the 20s. And they was talking like if it broke 24, we'll never be able to get out of debt and all this stuff. And now it's 30. I think it's around 33. 33. Trillion. We're going to pay that back. Where did it go? Oh, a few hundred million to study the sexual interests of a three-toed beetle. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Give some kind of toad cocaine to see how it affects them. Million. That, I... I I mean, I, you think I'm joking, but if you can see how frivolous and foolish they are with that money, it'd, it'd just blow your mind. I didn't even get to get with it, but uh, well, there are legitimate cases where people do need help. And it was the church's, it's the family's place first to take care of their own. A man won't take care of his own worse than infidel, what the Bible says. There was a time when a man, you, 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 you cut, out the, cut out the welfare checks and the cheese, and a man would go to work. I said a man would go to work. That's because men used to have character. They, they used to be, the thought of their kids or their wife doing without, they would do anything, sacrifice anything, provide for them. Nowadays, I think they'd let them starve to death and watch them. It's pitiful. But that, that used to be the, the norm, was men had character. But, but the government stepped in and taken all the money and blown it foolishly, and they've got all these programs and stuff, so I'm saying if you can go through a program and you can get it, get it. 
I'd rather see somebody that needs it get it, somebody that deserves it and gets it, rather than it just be spent frivolously. Amen. And, and my belief is don't give Uncle Sam the more than you have to. Because he's not going to do right with it. He's done proved it. All right.